everybody. What's happening? Let's welcome our campuses, South Shore and Plant City. Go ahead and turn this off. For some reason, the microphone works back there. It doesn't work up here. Must be the anointing on the stage. You know what I'm saying? Well, God's good. Let's go to the let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for today. We're asking that you would change us. We we pray for the Ukraine. We pray for the men and women who are literally entering the streets, fighting for their lives. We pray that we would have movement in our government and undo the mess we've made over there. And Father God, help us to be who you want us to be. You are always, here's, here's what we say, church. Listen, you're always on your throne, God. They're always on your throne. Give courage and way, strength and wisdom in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen and amen. We're in a series called the 90 Day Tide Challenge. I'll talk to you about that in a second. You should have all received a, a card that looks like this, got information on the back. And today I just want to talk about the heart. I really just want to talk about what it means for God to access your heart. So we're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. And, um, and, and so I'll, I'll begin like this. Years ago in seminary, there's a man that came to preach. We had chapel every week, and his name is Paul Youngi Cho. He's the pastor of uh, Yoido Full Gospel Church in Seoul, Korea. He's the, the pastor of the largest church in the world, and it's been in the world for a long, long time uh, in Seoul. There are a million people that attend his church, a million there's a couple more than are here today across our campuses, but you know, God's good. We're working on it. We're working it out, We're working it out. A million people, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pastoral staff, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of services every week. The, the services actually start on Tuesday, they end on Sunday. And so, I mean, it, it just, it goes round and round. And, and so Paul Youngie came to our seminary in Dallas, uh, Texas and Fort Worth actually. And he came to the platform and uh, he started to weep. And, uh, and so we all thought as seminary students, you're listening to people who are polished and incredible orators and, and uh, five minutes in, he was re he's still weeping. And then 10 minutes, he's still weeping. And we start to look at each other, 15 minutes, he's still weeping. And at 20 minutes, something happened. Something broke out. <clears throat> something literally broke out from his spirit. And I, and I would... Some of you say, no, you're crazy, but there was actually some kind of mist or fog that entered into the room. And at 20 minutes, uh, the place broke open and everyone started to weep and there were 400 people at the altar. And he said, I'll, I'll never forget it, if he finally took the mic at 20 minutes and he said, in my country, I pray two to three hours before I teach. He said, but in America, I have to pray five to six hours because of the hardness of your hearts. I'll never forget that moment. I'll, I'll never forget that moment. If, if God, church, the whole, the, 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 the Sermon on the Mount is about access to our hearts. And what God did is he sent Moses at Sinai and at Sinai, Moses came down with the 10 commandments. And, and um, so because of the hardness of the hearts of men in the Old Testament, you had to get it right. Everybody say, get it right. Yeah. Like you had to get it right. You had to do it right. And the law was there to judge you if you didn't. And the Holy Spirit wasn't present with every person. The Holy Spirit would visit, visit a person, and then be removed from the person. Aren't you thankful for the new covenant, church? Amen. So in the new covenant, Jesus gathers his disciples and he says, I want to update the law. And it's the Sermon on the Mount. It's chapter five, six, and seven of the book of Matthew. If you've got it, you can go there. Um, and how many of you are still using your, your paper Bibles? Come on, and, and, right, there's holy, there's holy ruff, rustling going on, all right? And, and uh, the digital version is just as anointed, all right? I want you to know you can write in the digital version. We have the Crossing app. All the notes are in there. You can write in that one. You can write in your Bible. I, uh, when I came out of Catholicism and I heard the person say for the first time, you can write in your Bible, I about fell out of my chair. Uh, this is impossible. God wants to take those pages from an icon into what is your, your destiny. He, he wants to put it inside of you. He really wants to, he wants to put it inside of you. And so we'll follow along. And some years ago, 2018, we went to the, the promised land, go to Israel. We believe that whoever blesses Israel is blessed by God. We believe that Israel's first. And if you've not been there, boy, you really, you really want to go. And, um, so we went to the place of the Beatitudes, where the Mount of the Beatitudes are, where the Sermon of the Mount was, was taught. It's this gorgeous place, kind of a, a hill looking over the Sea of Galilee. And just on the other side of this church, this is the Church of the Beatitudes now, there is this uh, beautiful kind of shaded area. And it is like you're in an amphitheater. 
is just the most natural, the most conducive place to just teach and speak that Jesus would have gathered his disciples and his, the apostles and those that were following. And he was saying, here's what he was saying. The law looked like this and Sinai looked like this and not having the spirit look like this, but I'm here and the spirit has come and this is the new covenant and let me update the law for you. Let me update the law. Let me show you what it sounds like in the new covenant, in the new covenant. And uh, so we left there and we went up and had some fish. How many of you know that eating fish is of Jesus? Yeah. All right, we had some fish on the Sea of Galilee and then my son wanted to fish and uh, we ended up going down. This was my son a couple of years ago. Now he's taller than I am. Uh, and, and it was just in 2018. And so he caught a catfish in the Sea of Galilee. And so he joined the fisherman, the fisherman's club. All right. And uh, um, it, was a lot, it was a lot of fun. And God was speaking to us while we were there. Just trying to paint the picture for you that Jesus really wants access to our hearts. And here's what he's saying. I want you to live from your heart. I want you to think, I want you to use your mind, but don't be controlled just by your mind. Uh, uh, use your analytics, but then I want you to feel from in here. Come on, everybody. Come on, in our nation, what we need is this. The Bible says that the heart of a man is in, actually the Bible says it's in the center of a person, which is actually in their gut, their stomach. And so he's saying heart, I want, I, want, I want to access your heart. If Jesus can access your heart, if he can make a home in your heart, you have a sure foundation. And there is no government, there is no red, there's no blue, there's no politics, there's no finances that can shake your foundation if you've got Jesus as your foundation. There, there, there's, no, there's no COVID, there's no narrative, there's no masker. No, there's the ever maskers and the never maskers. You know, we, we got a red, we got a blue. We got a black and we got a white. Jesus says, get rid of all that stuff. Get rid of all of it. I don't want you, I don't want you messing with that stuff. Listen, I've got, a, I've got a sermon for you. It's not the law, it's the update of the law. You're gonna complete all the law by walking in the spirit. And, and if you just insist on, God is saying here in the Sermon on the Mount, do it my way and I promise I'm gonna anchor you in a place where you cannot be shaken. You cannot be shaken. And, I'm, and, and boy, we need it, don't we? Well, we need it, don't we? Well, we need it. So the Beatitudes is the first section. I'm gonna go through three chapters and some of you said, ha ha, pastor, we gotta go to lunch. And, and, and uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it by title. I'm going to do it by section. And I'm just going to comment on each one of the sections. So I'm going to cover three chapters of scripture today. I know you think it's impossible, but here we go. Boom, boom. All right, the Beatitudes. Here's what Jesus is saying. If you're taking notes, he says there are eight blessed. Blessed are this, blessed are this, blessed are this, blessed are this. And here's what we believe in the world. You're blessed if you're beautiful. You're blessed if you're a certain color. You're blessed if you're so tall. You're blessed if you have the intellect. You're blessed if you have an education. You're blessed if you have the money and you're blessed if you have the car and you're blessed if you have the house. Jesus says, stop it. Jesus says, you guys stop. You guys gotta stop it. He says, I want you to know you're blessed when you're poor in spirit. You're blessed when you mourn. You're blessed when you're meek. And meekness is strength that has the bridle of Jesus in the mouth of the strong horse. Strength. I want you to see the world says you need to be strong. You need to push your, your brother out of the way. You need to climb to the top, be assertive, all those things. Jesus says, I want you to be meek and under control. And then you have power. And then the power of God will come into your life. He says, blessed, blessed, blessed. The first note is, is that this kingdom is an inverted kingdom. It's an upside down kingdom. Russia, I say it this way. It's a right side up kingdom. Come on, somebody. It's a right side up kingdom. This is the first, th this is the Beatitudes, important eight statements. He said, salt and light. When he talks about salt and light, he's speaking to us in an antiquity. Um, salt was the preserving agent of all things. Could you imagine not having refrigeration? <laughs> You guys are like, mm mm, I like my steaks cold. Not having refrigeration. The Lord is saying that He wants us, He's not talking about refrigeration, He wants us to be the salt. I want you to preserve in your marriages, in your homes, in your culture, in your community. I want you to be preserving. In other words, I want you to keep things from rotting. But he's not only saying keep things from rotting, I want you to be a light that shows people what it looks like to live for Jesus. I want you to be salt and I want you to be light. I want your light to so shine before men that they see your good works and they glorify your father who's in heaven. I want you to be salt and I want you to be light. And then he talks about fulfilling the law. And when he talks about fulfilling the law, he says, I want you to know that you fulfill the law when you walk in the spirit. 
And when you walk in the spirit, the jot and the tittle, the Bible says, and the jot is just the period over an I and the tittle is the cross over a T. The jot and the tittle are complete. Some of you think that you've got, we've got to live this list of rules in front of God. And he says, listen, you'll get the rules right if your spirit's right. If, you, if we're worried about the rules, we're gonna get caught up in rule keeping. If you're, if you're worried about the rules, you're gonna be, do you know that Jesus is a scandalous forgiver? <laughs> scandalous. You think they don't, they don't, you know, all of this, everything that Jesus is saying here is updating the law. And he scandalously forgives people. It just is, it's ridiculous. You know, you know, here's what I wanna tell you. He forgave you and me. Oh my goodness, it's pretty scandalous. He forgave you and he forgave me. Three times in here, he's talking about forgiveness. Forgiveness, I want you to forgive them. Why? Because you've been forgiven. I want you to forgive because you've been forgiven. He talks about the spirit of murder here and he says, you've heard it says, said that you think murder is like this. Bang, bang, somebody's dead. He said, I wanna update that for you. That's the law, that's the Old Testament, that's the Old Covenant. That's bang, bang, someone's dead. Here's what I want you to know. When you speak against somebody, it's called raka. When you curse somebody, when you have in your heart disdain for another human being, bang, bang, you're dead. And he said, it's the same spirit. Some years ago, I was uh, at Brandon Mall uh, during Christmas time. And uh, just, just to tell you, don't ever go to Brandon Mall during Christmas time. <laughs> Can I get an amen? It's just glory, Jesus, glory. Never do it. Don't do it. Thou shall not. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so we have Amazon now, right? <laughs> this is Amazon. Um, Amazon's got its own issues, doesn't it? <laughs> It was his own problem. And so I was coming out of the mall, had some bags with me, and a guy came in a big, big truck, big guy, big truck, came by me, and, and he almost hit me. I said, hey, you know, I said, whoa. And he zoomed, big truck. He went down this lane, he had to go all the way down, and he parked, and he got out of his truck, and he was almost, he was almost running towards me. And I could see him, and then he did like this. And that's the international sign for I've got a gun. And so, he's, so he put his hand behind his back like this. And, I, and, and so I was like, oh, this is nothing but trouble. So I went to the right. I walked two lanes past my car. He followed me. I went down the lane. He followed me all the way down the lane. Some of you know where I'm talking about, over by the food court. You know what I'm saying? Lane seven. <laughs> I went mean, all the way down the lane and he was following behind me and he was catching up with me. And then I took a left and I was saying to Jesus, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Because if he had a weapon, all I have is me. And I'm so and so. I'm saying, you got to help me. And he got about 40 yards to me. I, got, I finally got to my truck and he said this. He said, I've been wanting to kill somebody at Christmas time. And so, and I knew. So, so listen, here's what we, here's what we think. That guy, uh, I got in my truck. I was safe. I wasn't shot. <laughs> I made it. I made it. God's good. Some of you guys are like, you did? No, I was shot, right? No, I'm serious. I, was, I made it. But we think that's the spirit of murder. Here's what God says. Whenever you hate your brother or sister, that same spirit is right here. The very same attitude that gets a hold, that got a hold of him. And it's terrible. That's a terrible story, isn't it? It was just terrible. Wrong place, wrong time, wrong spirit, wrong thing. That same spirit is in operation with us when we choose to not forgive our brother, our sister, our mother, our friend, our uncle, somebody that's different than us, somebody that talks different than us, walks different than us. Whatever it is, it's the same spirit. He updates the law. He, just, he updates the law. The next one, and the heaviest subject matter is in the fifth chapter. Um, he talks about adultery and he says, you've heard it said that adultery looks like this, but he says adultery really is having lust in your heart for a male or a female and anybody who has lust uh, goes all the way up and that is adultery, same spirit. He says the same one. And, and so that's why pornography is so difficult, so damning in our culture. And that's why God is addressing it here on the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying, blessed if you mourn. Well, I'm gonna mourn so that I can stay away from the things that God wants me to stay away from. That's what I'm gonna do. If you're looking at pornography, male or female, the stats say that seven out of 10 Christian men now are caught by pornography, not view pornography um, irregularly, like once a month. They mean caught, seven out of 10, 
And then I said, some stats say 50% of ladies are in the category now, most say 30%, so three out of 10 in pornography. And, and so here's my theory, is that social media is serving us what we're asking for. And it's not, I mean, you could not be asking for it and it still comes to you. And so I think we need two things, right? Everybody with me? You guys okay? Okay, you breathing? Everybody breathing? Okay, you guys are like, <laughs> okay, if, 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 if you're caught by pornography, listen, God doesn't shame you or damn you. He doesn't do it. Everything that Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount and everything that comes in the gospel isn't to keep you down, it's to help you up. It is not to beat you down or break you down. It is to lift you out of the mire. It is to call you up into a higher place. God, listen, if God, yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, church, listen, come on. If God was mad at you with sin, he couldn't send his son. Because of our sin, he sent his son and our sin was imputed to him on his body and he died on the cross for our sin. Thank God that he took our punishment. Thank God, thank God. Jesus took the punishment so that we don't have to take the punishment. I don't mean that this is an easy gospel because the gospel will cost you everything. It'll cost you everything. And, and, and Jesus wants the center of our hearts. But if, we're look, if you're looking at pornography, you need two things. We need the power of God first, right? In Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It separates the bone from the marrow and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of your heart. And so if you're struggling with pornography, go to the word. Come on, somebody. If you're struggling with pornography, go to the Word. You say, why, why do I go to the Word? I can't read anything in the Word. Worship and go to the Word and let the Word speak to you because the Word can say to you what no one else can say to you. The Word can convict you and the conviction, conviction means boom, the gavel goes down, boom. But the gavel doesn't go down for prison, boom. The gavel goes down for boom, I'm gonna judge the devil. The judgment goes against the thing you're struggling with, not against you. Consequences for sin always happen, but God is saying to us, what I wanna do is I wanna release you from the prison you're living in. And so you need the power of the word of God. Secondly, we need, if we're gonna be prophetic, we need to be practical. So let me just ask you to do this. If uh, Limit what social media can say to you. There's all kinds of guards out there. There's literally hundreds of applications that you can go online or on your social media and it can limit the content that comes to you. And you can actually cut it off. And if you can't limit it, go ahead and get rid of your social media. Come on, just get rid of it. Some of you are like, I can't get rid of social media. Yeah, you can. Yeah, just cut it off. Take it, take it off. If, you, if, if you're stirred up watching the news, change the news station. Because the news station is depending on you being stirred up so we can sell you more content. And so if you're watching something that is disturbing your spirit, just change what you're watching. Matter of fact, write down, write down what you're getting from the news station you're watching, turn it off, and then turn it back on a month from now and see if the narrative has changed. <laughs> Somebody help me. You guys are like, oh, you don't want to. I think we should stay up with the news, but read the news. You can read the news. And by the way, every person that was, you know, it used to be, you know, somebody who was on an island and they got voted off or whatever it was, right? Remember? <laughs> You guys, some of you, how many of you dated with me? You dated with me? Who got voted off the island? You know what I mean? The next show was about somebody else who's on the island. Same show. Same thing with social media. It's the same thing. Okay, let me keep, let me keep going. He talks about divorce. God says, divorce isn't my plan. And, but, but we know that 50% of the people that are in our nation go through divorce. Why? Because it's really difficult to love another person the way God loves you. It's really difficult. And divorce breaks. Divorce hurts mom. It hurts dad. It hurts the kids. It hurts the grandkids. It hurts everybody. But here's what God says. On the other side of making mistakes is my grace. Divorce is not my best, but on the other side of that, my, my mom and dad are in that category and blended five kids. It was the craziest thing you've ever seen. A Latin lady with a redneck guy from Riverview. Hmm. <laughs> That's fireworks and five kids. And my dad read this scripture in Matthew chapter five and it says, if you, if you have divorced and you're remarried, you're living in adultery, same spirit. And it concerned him really bad. Some of you have read the scripture. You don't have to raise your hands. You've read the scripture and you said, man, I, I don't, maybe I need to separate in this marriage because I'm living in adultery. If I, had, I was divorced and it was adulterous and that, whatever. And so, and the Lord woke him up one night and said, uh, woke him up in the middle of the night and said, go read Psalm 32. 
That's an amazing thing when God rouses you from your sleep and says, go read Psalm 32. And my dad said, on the way to getting the Bible, he said, okay, I'm gonna read Psalm 23. God said, no, not Psalm 23, Psalm 32. And in Psalm 32, here's what it says. Blessed is the man whose sins have been forgiven. Come on, church. Listen to me. And then verse five, I do not mean to say to you because consequences happen and divorce hurts. It hurts everybody, doesn't it? It does. It's consequences, the consequences stay. But I want you to know, listen, you had an you had alcoholic, generational alcoholic, Jesus can redeem it. So, so you've gone through divorce, Jesus can redeem it. So you've sinned, you, you've had adultery, you've sinned, Jesus can redeem it. Jesus is the redeemer. It doesn't mean that there isn't pain, doesn't mean there isn't penalty of some kind, that means there is consequence for sin, but Jesus is on the other side saying, I scandalously forgive you. Why? Because I want you to be redeemed in your mess. I didn't leave you here. In verse five, it says that the man that seeks God with their whole heart, the man or woman that seeks God with their whole heart is the one that he answers from the heart. This whole thing, the Sermon on the Mount, everybody say heart. It's all about your 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 heart. It's what God wants to do. He wants to access our heart. And so he talks about oaths and he says, keep your oath to God and keep your oath to one another. Keep the vertical, keep the horizontal. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. How many of you have heard that, uh, right? That's Old Testament. God says, get rid of that junk. If somebody hurts you, it says, give them your coat and walk with them an extra mile. And you say, how in the world am I supposed to do that? The next category says, I want you to love your enemies. How do I love my enemies? I mean, I love my friends, barely. <laughs> Come on. You know what the Bible says? The love of most is gonna go grow cold at the end of days. How many of you believe that we're in the end of days? So, I, so how, I mean, seriously, well, I believe we're in the beginning of the end. You say, I don't know what that looks like, but man, war, famine, and flood. You, just go look up war, famine, and flood. We're, we're, so, but here's the, here's the answer. The answer isn't blue. The answer isn't red. The answer isn't money. The answer isn't looks. The answer isn't fame. The answer is Jesus. His foundation is what we're looking for, church. It's the foundation. It's, it's literally the foundation that we anchor ourselves in Jesus that keeps us from being blown in all of these winds because the winds are, I mean, COVID, no COVID. You know what I mean? You know, Delta, no Delta. Everything that we're going through, science, no science, truth, no truth, everything that we're going through, gender, no gender, all of these things, our, our culture, if you haven't noticed, our culture's upside down. And Jesus says, the key, everybody say the key, the key, to most of this is not letting your love grow cold. And if Jesus, if God can find a happy place, a home in your heart, then you'll build a foundation that is unshakable. It's absolutely unshakable. No one can shake it. No one can take it from you. He says, I want you to be perfect how, the way I'm perfect. I want you to forgive those who have sinned against you. 70 times seven. I want you to forgive, 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 forgive. And, say, and then he says at the end, I want you to be perfect. How many of you agree that you're just perfect? I mean, if you think you're, just ask your spouse, am I perfect? Just say to them, I know I am, but I, I mean, affirm for me. You know, we know we're not perfect. Here's what God is saying. The perfect one, come on, don't miss this. The perfect one lives inside of you. And as you're perfecting his presence inside of you, you can do as an imperfect person what a perfect person does coming out of you. Let me, let me say it again, listen to me. We are imperfect people. We house a perfect God, his spirit is perfect. So to the degree that I can access his perfect spirit, I can forgive when I do not want to. I can bless when I wanna curse. I can agree when I want to disagree. Uh, we can have peace when, when I want to fight. Are you with me? Okay. That's the heaviest content in, in chapter five and chapter six. He says, giving to the needy. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand can, is doing because when you give, you could think that it is special because you're giving. And so God says, I've given you everything. He says, trick yourself and keep it a secret. Keep yourself under the radar when you give. And then he talks about prayer and the Lord's prayer. And then, so let's read the Lord's Prayer together. I know that we all know it. It's important. I want to unpack it for you just briefly. Then he says this. This is how we should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Come on, everybody that knows this, right? You can, you can join me. Is it on the scripture? There we go. Okay, it's on, the, it's on the screen so we can all do it. I'll start over, okay? 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Get that. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now here's the verse we don't often read is verse 14. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. And then it goes on and says, if you can't forgive them, if you're having trouble horizontally, it's a picture that you're having trouble vertically. If you're having trouble horizontally, then we're having trouble vertically. And God says, you cut yourself off from me as a source. When I don't, when I don't forgive, then I harden my heart and my prayers go up to an iron ceiling. And they hit the ceiling and they come back down. And nobody wants their prayers. Everybody wants their prayers to ascend before heaven, right? And so forgive. And if I don't forgive, then I cut myself off. And when I cut myself off, I isolate myself from the things that make me happy. How many of you wanna be happy? <laughs> Hey, happy, happy, come on, happy, joyful, full of life, not angry, bitter, happy. Happiness comes from the source who's your savior. And when I'm not praying and I let animosity and bitterness and judgment and all those things, when I let that happen to me, then my natural appetites come to the surface. And when my natural appetites come to the surface, Satan takes advantage of me and you. So uh, here, let me, let, me, let me give you the example. This is the Lord's Prayer. How many of you know that Google and the analytics in Google and Apple and all those things are listening to you? If you don't believe that, God bless you. <laughs> if you don't believe that, do this for me. Just take your phone, go on a ride that's about an hour long. If you don't believe that they're listening, put your phone in the back seat turn your other phone off. So if it's two of you, turn your phone off and talk about something random like bounce houses and drive for an hour and talk about bounce houses two or three times. And when you're done with that hour, you'll have four ads for bounce houses. <laughs> Satan knows, Satan plays the same game with you and me. So when I cut myself off from the source, which is the Lord's prayer, I'm not praying, I'm not depending, I'm not, I'm not forgiving. When I do, all of my appetites come to the front and I'm advertising to the devil how to advertise to me. And as, as my advertisements come up, he feeds me what I'm asking for. That's exactly what happens on your phone. And so when that, so God's saying, he's saying, how do you figure this whole thing out? Everybody say forgive. 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 And when you forgive, then the portal opens up and your source comes to you in fullness of grace. And you understand I, I'm not the center of the universe and I'm gonna forgive because he's forgiven me. And then my appetites come down here. Come on, everybody, come on, come on with me. Your appetites come down here and then the devil's quieter because he can't access you as much. <laughs> For, listen, hey, forgive us our debts and keep me from the evil one. If, if, I, if, if, if I'm, my, my debts aren't forgiven, if I'm not forgiving somebody of my, well, I've preached it long enough, God bless you, I'm moving on. <laughs> Fasting, the Lord said, come on, let's go. Fasting, it's done for the inside, not for the outside, treasures in heaven. Do not store it for yourselves, tre treasures on earth, where rust, oh, rust. <laughs> That's rust and moth combined. <laughs> That's for free today, rust it up. <laughs> where rust and moth destroy. That's what he says. Don't store, don't do that. He says, because no one can serve two masters. You can only serve one master. And so money, we start to worry. The last section of scripture says, don't worry. Don't worry about today. Don't worry about tomorrow because God dresses us like the lily of the field. Don't worry about where you're gonna eat. Don't worry about where you're gonna go. Don't worry about your job. How many of you would love to stop worrying right now? Come on. Go ahead, take a deep breath. Listen, I want you to know your father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's never left you, nor has he ever forsaken you. And he will not leave you begging for bread. <clears throat> In the New Testament, in Acts chapter two, when the apostles gathered together and they prayed, they consecrated themselves to the Lord. They sinked our hearts to the Lord. And when they did, the place was shaken. And the Bible says that the use of that term was like taking a, a, a rain jacket and spraying it with water. So the water is on the jacket. And then when the place was shaken, God said, it's like you took the garment and went. So obviously, can you see the picture of the water coming off the garment? They were shaken from their possessions. 
And the Bible says that they were in concert together and listened to the word that was taught and prayed together and they fasted together and they had all things in common and they were shaken from their possessions and all of them gave to those who had need. Would it be a New Testament miracle if just across our campuses, the crossing church at other churches, we all said, I have enough, here you have, if somebody has lack, here you go. The, the, the New Testament church is a church that says, my heart is so devoted to God that everything I have is God's. Come on, church. Everything I have is his. It's, it's not, so whatever you have, I'll make this statement, I'll move on. Whatever you have that's not 100% his, has you. God is okay with you having stuff. Isn't, isn't it cool? Are you guys okay having stuff? Some of you guys are like, mm, that's a trick question. You're tricking us. <laughs> He goes like, mm-mm, not stuff. God is okay with houses and clothes and all those things. God's okay with you having stuff as long as stuff doesn't have you. And anything that's not 100% God's is a God to you. Help me out, you guys. It got awful quiet in this Methodist church. Anything any, 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 anything, your heart, your mind, your clothes, your house, your bank account, your 401k, your retirement, anything that's not 100% God's is a God. Because we're easy to pick up God's. We, human beings, I mean, we could make a God. The whole Old Testament talks about them making God's out of little stone tablets. Today, they're images, right? Okay, everybody with me? You still with me? You okay? Everybody breathing? All right, rock and roll. Here we go. We're, we're through two chapters. We just got one chapter left. Can we make it? Hey. I'll go quicker. New York style. By the way, I welcome all of you from New York, California, and Chicago. We love you. I mean, it's Tampa's the new Atlanta. He says, don't judge. The next section of scripture, don't judge. And, and there's a picture where he says, there's a plank in my own eye, a plank, a two by six. And so I've got, just picture me with this, this, this two by six sticking out of my eye. And then I call somebody up on stage and, and I have to obtusely get around you. The plank in my eye is banging into you and then I'm getting close enough to you and I say, I see there's a little speck in your eye right there. You get the picture? Jesus is saying, you don't have to judge anybody else. If, if, he says, if you're wise, show your wisdom to the world. Show other people what it looks like. You don't have to judge them. Next one, ask, seek, and knock, Luke chapter 10. Jesus said that he would give us the Holy Spirit. He says, I want you to knock at the door. I want you to ask, and I want you to seek. How many of you need something right now from God? Oh, come on now. Come on, church. Come on. Go, go to the door. Go to the door. Ask, seek, knock. And he says, I'll give you even the person, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. The scripture goes on and says there are false prophets and then there are false disciples. And false prophets are the people, if you wanna know who's speaking the truth, don't look at the person on the platform, look at their marriage. Don't look at how fancy somebody can say something, look at what somebody's character does over a lifetime. Look at their marriage, look at their children, look at their finances, and then determine, sift through the word of God is what they're saying right. I'm gonna use the word of God to determine what's right, but I'm also gonna match their character to the word because if their character's flawed, they're gonna fall at some point. They're going down. They're going down. Here's what he said about, so you guys are like, Hercules, Hercules, yes. Here's what he wants, here's what he says about disciples. You cannot deep fake your relationship with Jesus. How do you know what a deep fake is? How many of you don't know what a deep fake is? Let's do that. How many of you do not know what a deep fake is? Okay, right now they're taking digital scans of a person's face and their audio. And so somebody who is not that person, go online and, and um, Google deep fake Tom Cruise. And so what it is, it's an actor that looks a little bit like Tom Cruise and then they've actually taken Tom Cruise's digital portrait and they put Tom Cruise's digital portrait on this guy and the guy that's talking isn't Tom, but we're sure it's Tom. Yeah, it's a, it's a little scary. It is a little scary. But here's what God's saying. You can't deep fake me. Jeez. He says, become one, one day, even those who say to me, I cast out demons in your name, he's gonna sit, the Father is there and Jesus is there and Jesus is gonna say, I wanna tell you I have a relationship with this person. Come on, church. I have a relationship with them. 
And because you have relationship with him, then you have entrance into eternity. And then the last part of the scripture that I wanted to bring you is that there's a distinction between two houses. One is built on a rock and one is built on sand. He says, the wise builder, the one who hears these words. And so picture Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, the one who hears these words and they listen to me and they put them into practice. They're doers of the word is the one who builds their foundation, their house on a rock. And the one who does not do these words, do not put them into practice. They built them on the sand. And then he says, the rains came and the winds blew and the floods came. And he says, the house that's built on sand, eventually it just erodes, it just goes away. And so what I wanna say to you today, in 2022, when it's cray cray, we got COVID, we got the Deltas, we, we've, got, we've got war around the world, we've got divorce, we've got genocide, we've got depression and anxiety and brokenness, but Jesus is the answer. Yeah. When you guys, you guys can come on out. Okay, you guys can come on out. And I just wanna, I wanna give you an invitation now, and the invitation is just simply to trust Jesus as Savior. It's just to, just to put your anchor in him. And for some of you to recommit to Jesus as your savior, to just say to him, Lord Jesus, my foundation is in you alone. And no, the gates of hell won't shake my faith. No politics, no disease, no wrong will shake my foundation in Jesus. And so across our campuses, all of you, would you just bow your heads with me for just a moment? This is just this, I, I don't want this to be religious. I want it to be relational. Also, every one of you across campuses, those of you at home, let's say this together. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender today. I trust you today. Establish your kingdom in me. I choose you as my foundation come into my heart. If you prayed that way, heads bowed and eyes closed for the first time today, would you indicate to us that you're praying that way on the count of three and raise your hands. One, two, three. Raise your hands. I see you. Would you hold them up for us? Thank you. Just hold them up for one second. We're gonna bring you a card. Hold them up for one, one moment. We see you, friend. We see you right here in the middle. We'll raise them nice and tall, a pretty big place. We just wanna get you a card. We wanna come to you. We just wanna help you take the next step. Amen, anybody else across our campuses? If you're in the balcony of the bleachers, would you raise your hand nice, real big wave to us? Kind of sometimes the lights shine us out. I see you. Anybody else? Anybody else today? I'm establishing my firm foundation. Now, anybody who's recommitting their life to Jesus, you've trusted Christ before, but today you're recommitting. Would you slip your hand up? Raise your hand. I see you, friend. I see you. I see you, I see you, I see you. Amen, I see you. Amen, I see you. Make a fresh start today. Okay, we got, we got raised hands right here. Can you guys make it to them? Would you guys make it to them? We got raised, more raised hands, more raised hands, more, 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 more. today. Come on, can we just thank him? Yes, Lord. Okay. A couple of quick, quick things that are prophetic and, and we're going to stand for a moment, give you access to come to the altar if you, if you would like to. Matter of fact, why don't we stand together now? Here's what the Lord, here's, if, if, if this makes sense to you, if it resonates with you, I'm going to ask you to just immediately, just immediately, Immediately, just leave where you are, come to the altar. No, number one thing the Lord said is that some of you are swimming upstream. And you really, the picture I got of a person who's really trying to serve God, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, maybe even with the word, and you're swimming and the culture is getting to you. The pressure is getting to you. The pressure at work, the political pressure, the cancel culture, the all of the, the isms that should have been wasms, they're all getting to you and it's overwhelming you. 
and the person swimming upstream, I just saw this picture and I could see you weakening and then saying, I'm about to give up. And listen, listen, God is saying, don't give up, don't give up. Listen, don't give up. If, that, if that's you, you, you can begin to make your way right now. You can just start to come right now. We just say, I'm just feeling a weakness that I've not felt before. You just start to come right now. Amen. Secondly, some God said that some of you are being reckless with yourselves. You're being reckless. You're hurting on the inside, and so you're doing things that actually are hurting yourself. I don't know if you remember sort of the, I was a school teacher and kids would cut themselves. So here's what, here's what I wanna say to you. I mean, this, if this is you, don't be embarrassed at all. It could be something that's very, very minor. It could be something that's major. You're hurting yourself because you're hurting and you need, to, you need to just have somebody help you stop. You need to push the devil back. If that's you, come on, come on. Whatever it is, it could be looking at things. It could be doing things. It could be not doing what we need to do. And then the last one he said, and this, is, this was a big one. He said, good people who've never thought about suicide before are being plagued with suicide. The thoughts of suicide. And if that's crossing your mind, if it's happening, I'm gonna disappear now, I'm gonna get out of the way. Father, would you empower us to move for you so that we establish our lives on your rock, which is the foundation. We're gonna sing, you can come, and then Pastor Jeremy's gonna cl close this. God bless you, love you so much.